This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Danny Berger and Priti Gupta. It's 5 a.m. in New York, 10 a.m. in London, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. China delivers its strongest ever pushback against a weaker currency as it seeks to repair market confidence battered by disappointing data and widespread credit fears. Plus, new details emerge on what could be the year's biggest IPO. SoftBank's arm is said to have lined up 28 banks, a reflection of the chipmaker's global reach. Plus, seeking common ground, President Joe Biden set to host his counterparts from both South Korea and Japan today at Camp David, a three-way commitment spanning technology, diplomacy, even security, all on the agenda. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York. Danny Berger is off. Let's dive right into the market action because it is a sea of red no matter where you look, specifically in the equity indices. And a lot of it is coming and stemming from the Asian story. The Hang Seng Index down about 2% overnight. Again, it's the same concerns. The property sector, the Chinese data, just how strong is the Chinese consumer and does that matter for global markets? Nevertheless, the fears around all of that, sending the Hang Seng into bear market territory, that, of course, not boding well for sentiment in Europe as well. You are seeing the stock 600 down about seven tenths of 1%. Put the two and two together. And again, you are setting the stage for a little bit of souring sentiment here in the States. What I will say, though, is that the pressure seems to be on your latest winner. So this week, a lot of the trade in the positive direction has been concentrated in those big tech names. Right now, you are seeing a lot of those winners actually take up a little bit of a pullback. Futures for our radio audience, 43.82. NASDAQ 100 futures down by about two-tenths of 1%. Let's get a quick look at the bond market as well, because you are seeing a bid for safety around the world, specifically over in Europe. The 10-year yield already in Germany coming down about eight basis points in this session. You are seeing that uh, kind of flow into the guilt story as well, down about five basis points. What's interesting about the U.S. bond market is it kind of seems to shrug off whatever you're seeing abroad, and that is going to be significant. The 10-year yield, 424 there, down about four basis points. Remember, the currency picture matters here specifically because, of course, you are seeing the U.S. uh, against the yuan seeing its strongest fix ever, 7.2 on that level. We're going to dive into it a little bit later in the show. For now, let's get to some European data that is crossing the terminal as we speak. Euro area final, July consumer prices rising 5.3% year over year. The estimate is it was pretty much bang on line. You're also seeing consumer prices fall about one-tenth of one percent on a month-over-month basis. Of course, the final July core CPI rising about five and a half percent on a year-by-year basis. Again, all the data coming in line. When it comes to the euro, not much action because you are seeing it flat. So 108 on that currency pair, the pound, 127. And if you look at kind of what's driving the Bloomberg dollar index as a whole right now, it is a tug of war between the pound and the Mexican peso. And that's really why you're seeing the Bloomberg dollar index flat right now. But keep an eye on this because super peso continues to become a story as it becomes a counterweight to perhaps the European numbers that we are seeing. Joining us now to break down all the data is Maria Tadeo, Bloomberg's European correspondent. She joins us from Brussels. Maria, your initial take on this data. Uh, yes, uh, critics, as you say, headline inflation came in at 5.3% for July, uh, July for the euro area, and then you had core inflation at 55 which is, of course, a number that we know the European Central Bank really looks at to see whether or not the forces of monetary policy are actually now kicking in to bring down inflation sustainably uh, closer to target at 2%. Now, the issue here fundamentally is when you ask me what does it mean for the European Central Bank, the reality is not a lot because this data happened to come out for the month of July, We know they're forward-looking, and the decision that will come in September, which, remember, uh, Madame Lagarde, the head of the ECB, she said could be both a rate hike or a halt would be dependent entirely on the forward-looking data. So again, a lot of this was already very much baked in. You see there's very little reaction because a lot of this fed already into the picture. The ECB, however, will be paying a lot of attention on the data that we get in the next few weeks to make that decision in September, where, again, the field is open between this hike or actually hold. Well, speaking of that, Maria, I mean, it's going to be a similar story when you talk about the Federal Reserve as well. I'm wondering what the read through might be uh, in either direction from what maybe Jay Powell is thinking to the ECB and vice versa, what Madame Lagarde is thinking for the Federal Reserve. 
Look, I think it's August, so the ECB talk, frankly, has been uh, quiet. We know where we left it, where the head of the ECB said the proof would be, uh, or the burden would be on the data. I remember, she is a lawyer by uh, training, so again, it's really saying a lot of this would be dictated by the data. We are waiting for that data to uh, come out. There's not been a lot of talk because, well, it's August, so it's vacation time uh, for a lot of Europeans, but I think we're going to see this pick up and that debate pick up in the weeks before. It's also a tight window to really hear where ECB policymakers uh, believe or debate in this because then you head into the quiet period. So there will be, I would say this is going to be a very interesting decision from the European Central Bank, frankly. And of course, as we speak as well, you are monitoring closely Georgia Maloney's windfall tax in Italy. Now, of course, we know she has gone very tough on a lot of the corporate sector there. What can you tell us about just how lucrative that tax might be? Uh, yeah, and today we have a story uh, on the Bloomberg that says the Italian government is going ahead with this windfall tax. Remember, it's 40 percent, although then they clarified that it would be capped at 0.1 percent of banks' assets uh, in Italy. What we report is that the Italian government, A, wants to continue ahead with this. They have approved it by decree, but it needs to go through the process that will happen after the summer when they go back to session, but also that they believe they can gather 2 to 3 billion euros uh, from this windfall tax, and then that money would be placed in a fund to help alleviate some of the pain from higher interest rates to the Italian consumer. How this translates in practicality, to me, it's still unclear because the details of this windfall tax are still thin. Now, the other thing we should uh, point out is that the European Central Bank, according to an Italian newspaper, Corriere della Sera, will send a letter to the Italian government complaining not so much about the tax. That's a sovereign decision, but they will complain about the fact that they were not informed that this was coming out. Remember, the European Central Bank heads financial stability for the entire uh, euro area for the time being, however, not official confirmation from the European Central Bank, but they did say they would express an opinion in due time. Yeah, the monetary very versus fiscal balance you are seeing specifically in Italy, but in broader Europe, a, a crucial story we're going to be watching. Mar Maria Tadeo joining us from Brussels. We thank you as always. And of course, we go from the continent to the UK specifically. Retail sales fell more than expected in July after a spell of cool and rainy weather. Surprise, surprise in London, keeping consumers at home. Joining us now, Bloomberg's Valerie Titel all over that data. It's interesting to see this kind of number, given that we've seen some really strong data coming out of the UK. What do you make of it? Uh, yeah, exactly, Critty. We had that massive beat in uh, in second quarter GDP just last Friday. So this is quite a turn of the narrative here. Uh, the retail sales uh, was pretty ugly this morning. It missed on all light items. And if you look at the revisions to prior month, they were all revised lower as well. The July data, if we look at it month on month, fell twice the amount it expected. And then those revisions coming even lower. Wet weather, as you mentioned, did contribute some to the drop. As you know, it was a pretty soggy July here in the UK. But all in all, in some way, this is bad for UK economic growth, but it's good news for the Bank of England. We've not really seen a lot of that front end pricing for the Bank of England change very much, though. We're still pricing in around 30 basis points uh, for their meeting uh, at the end of September and a BOE peak rate of just shy of 6%. Well, let's go from the BOE that you just mentioned to perhaps the BOJ, because overnight we also got some data coming out of Japan. Inflation actually slowing down. But Valerie, is the BOJ really responsible for that? Inflation is slowing down in Japan. Uh, maybe that's a bit of the global factors of global inflation falling. But if we look more into the deeper components of what that showed today, it did show that some of the sticky inflation is starting to rear its head. If you look at the services inflation component, Critty, it is still on the rise and actually hit 2% for the first time in 30 years. So this is still a possible risk traders have to keep on their minds that a BOJ hiking cycle could could still be in the cards sometime later this year or beginning of next year if inflation continues on this trajectory. We did see the yen uh, strengthen a bit after this data, but we should note, uh, you know, core inflation came in at 3.1 percent critty. The Bank of Japan just revised higher their own CPI estimates for this year to only two and a half. So there is a real risk that we have to see a, a substantial revision higher yet again from the BOJ to their year end uh, inflation forecast.
A lot of cross currents there as well. And Valerie, you did a great job yesterday really kind of outlining the fact that there are a lot of cross currents. It's not just monetary policy driving the move in yields right now. You are seeing essentially a lot of the holdings coming out of Saudi Arabia, for example, on Treasury, some of the fiscal pieces, even the market plumbing becoming a bigger issue. For you in the next, say, week or so, as we see this thin trading volume, what drives the global bond market? Well, look, next week it is a bit of a thin uh, on the data calendar. We do have those PMIs out for uh, not just the U.S., but for the globe on Wednesday, ahead of Powell's pivotal Jackson Hole speech coming late Friday. So really a bit light on the calendar. It's very pleasing to see, though, that this Treasury sell-off has taken a breather. That was the first thing that I looked at this morning when I walked in, was that we're seeing uh, this 10-year yields, those 30-year yields, the long-end yields that have captured so much of our attention this week, finally Finally, take a breather. However, we look to the equity markets and they have not. They are still in the red. Uh, this rise in real yields as these long end yields hover at cycle highs has really dented this equity rally. We've now seen a three day slide in the S&P 500. That is the worst since March. If we even look under the hood on that, Critty, we look at put option volume on the U.S. exchange. That's also spiked to the highest levels we've not seen uh, since mid-March as well. Yeah, a, a, a lot to digest. Valerie, I don't know, even know how you wrap your mind around all of it. We thank you, as always, for breaking it down for our global audience. And, of course, we go from the global bond market to one of, I think, the main issues when you talk about macro sentiment right now, of course, centered in China. Earnings reports from state-owned property developers sending warnings of widespread losses, fueling concerns that the crisis is indeed expanding. 18 out of 38 builders reported preliminary losses in the first half. That's up from 11 that warned of full-year losses just last year. Bloomberg's Donna El Beltaji joins us now. Donna, you're literally watching this China story unfold and guest after guest tells us, look, there isn't necessarily a read through into the broader market, but then you look at, say, something like the offshore yuan, where it has to deal with its strongest fixing on record and even the offshore hitting 7.31. How bad is this property sector drama? I actually think it's really bad because First of all, it's China. Second of all, we're talking about massive numbers here. And third, it's been going on for quite some time. When you're talking about a crisis like this in an economy like China, you're talking about an impact that will affect all sectors. We're talking about raw materials. We're talking about all the different industries that feed into property in China. And don't forget, we're also seeing some ripple effects into the shadow banking sector. A lot of people have invested in in this sector and that's and that's why more and more people are worried about the effects of these potential defaults that we're seeing in China. Um, it is a massive story not just for emerging markets it's a massive story for investors around the world. Well speaking of the kind of uh, pain that you were seeing in the sector let's bring about the Evergrande story a little bit of a blast from the past which is kind of rearing its ugly head again seeking chapter 15 bankruptcy protection stateside, shielding its potential U.S. assets from those creditors. What can you tell us about that story? Is this really a surprise? Look, it's not really a surprise. It's a normal process when you go through a restructuring that's outside of the U.S. that you would file a Chapter 15 if you do have some assets in the U.S. But it is a reminder of how complicated these restructurings really are because we're talking about massive numbers here. This isn't a small restructuring. This is hundreds of billions. And so for that reason, you know, this is a, you know, this has actually come at the same time as the property sector drama that's happening in China. So for those investors that are are involved in with the companies that are basically sounding the alarm in China they're looking at the creditors for Evergrande and thinking they're still in this this is still ongoing so yeah this is some major drama but for that actual fi filing it's just normal Certainly something we're going to be watching, especially as perhaps uh, we expect some other companies in the Chinese property sector to perhaps follow that lead. Dana el we thank you as always for breaking that down for us this morning. Coming up, we speak to the global head of economics and cross-asset at Society General. But up next on the program, big plans for SoftBank's arm. Over 20 banks lined up for what could be the year's biggest IPO. It's a story you do not want to miss. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York. Danny Berger is off. South Africa hosting a summit of the BRICS group of nations next week. Leaders are seeking to balance the Western dominance of the world order while dealing with their own internal divisions. Bloomberg's Jennifer Zabasacha takes a look at why more than 40 countries have now expressed interest in joining the club. BRICS, or Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. It's gone from an acronym to a powerful club that dozens of countries across the political spectrum want to join. The term was coined by economist Jim O'Neill in 2001 and was meant to highlight the rapid growth seen in these emerging economies. Initially BRIC, the S joined in 2010, extending the group's membership to Africa, to four continents, nearly a quarter of global GDP, and about a fifth of world trade. These nations saw their collective voice as a way to exert greater influence in a U.S.-dominated world. But much like other multilateral forums, such as the G7, producing an agreement at its annual gathering has become one of the biggest challenges. Now, more than 40 countries have expressed interest in joining the club, many of which are African. The BRICS partners are significant investors in Africa. Among the items on this year's agenda will be how to boost the influence of the so-called Global South in multilateral institutions, such as the United Nations. BRICS accounts for 42% of the world's population, but still only 15% of voting rights at the IMF and the World Bank. With the IMF predicting these nations' growth rates will soon surpass those of the G7, BRICS want a bigger voice in these bodies. And that's why some say this year's summit could prove critical for the future of the BRICS in an increasingly multipolar world. And we go from the BRICS summit to another major story. People around the world are watching. SoftBank's arm said to have lined up 28 banks as underwrite its for its highly anticipated IPO. It could be the biggest of the year, if not on record. The UK-based chip maker is aiming to be valued in the 60 to $70 billion range at the listing. Let's bring in Bloomberg's deals reporter, Manuel Bayori, in Hong Kong now for more. Manuel, a pleasure to have you on the show here. This is such a highly anticipated IPO, specifically because you have the likes of NVIDIA, Intel, even Amazon trying to become anchor investors for it. Is it overhyped? Your thoughts? Definitely a lot of people watching this IPO, as, as you said, uh, perhaps the biggest uh, equity capital markets event uh, of the year. Everybody here in Hong Kong, uh, London, New York is, is watching this IPO closely. People working through the summer to get it done as early as September, as we have reported out. And uh, we'll see, because it's going to be a really big IPO. There's going to be a lot of paper to print. and and and. and if it is successful, it will be a landmark IPO and it will probably set the tone for other IPOs to come during the year. We are coming, we're suffering a, a drought in deal making activity, you name it, IPOs, M&A, fundraising in private markets. So this will uh, be definitely one to watch closely because it could really pave the way for others to come. Everybody definitely keeping a close eye on it. Yeah, the timing is really interesting for the ARM IPO specifically, simply because when you look at the actual fundamentals of the industry, the chip sector isn't exactly thriving right now. You're seeing a major change even in terms of the production lines, bringing a lot of that domestic production to the states as well. So I almost wonder how much appetite there will be when it does finally release. Manuel, you said a, a really interesting thing about deal volume kind of drying up a little bit. And I hear that from guest after guest, except here we are about a couple weeks away from September, and yet... Instacart also expecting to IPO then. What can you tell us about that? Another multi-billion uh, dollar company, right? I mean, uh, we've seen on this one, it's super interesting because we've seen the valuation coming down in the last couple of years. So um, it'll be interesting to see the uh, details on their finances and operations that they may disclose as early as next week uh, when they publicly file for, for a U.S. listing. And um, that will probably... Um, along with the terms that we might see uh, give some clues about the potential valuation. I think that it's going to be key both for the ARM IPO and for Instacart uh, to see 
the size of the IPO and the valuation and, 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 and whether we see investors coming in because it's such massive IPOs, you really need a lot of investors piling in and, and that will really, really um, be critical uh, yeah. on both. Uh, we'll see the valuation on Instacart. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting one to watch as well. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's probably not going to be as large as the Arm IPO, but it is, at the end of the day, an online grocery delivery company. And to your point, setting the tone for perhaps what could be a real shift from shopping in store to shopping online for the food you need every day. Manuel Baigori bringing us all the latest from Hong Kong. We thank you, as always. Coming up on the program, help wanted over at Goldman Sachs as the bank plans a hiring spree amid scrutiny by the Federal Reserve. That coming up next, this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York. Danny Berger is off. Let's get to some key news developments we're following in this hour. Hawaiian Electric's rating has been downgraded by Moody's. The firm says the downgrade was, quote, prompted by the heightened uncertainty facing the company in the wake of the catastrophic wildfires on Maui that could result in significant financial liabilities if the utility is found to be at fault once investigations are completed. The SEC is poised to allow the first exchange-traded funds based on Ether futures. It's a major win for several firms that long have sought to offer the products. The regulator isn't likely to block the products, which would be based on futures contracts for the second largest cryptocurrency. That, according to people familiar with the matter, nearly a dozen companies, including Volatility Shares, Bitwise, Roundhill, and ProShares, have filed to launch the ETFs. Goldman Sachs is going on a hiring spree in order to address concerns raised by banking supervisors, including the Federal Reserve, during a fresh bout of regulatory scrutiny. Several hundred back office staff are being enlisted, even as the firm cuts executives for money-making ranks amid a slump in deal business. We're going to bring you more on that story throughout Bloomberg Television. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. China delivers its strongest ever pushback against a weaker currency as it seeks to repair market confidence battered by both disappointing data and widespread credit fears. And new details on what could be the year's biggest IPO. SoftBank's arm said to have lined up 28 banks, a reflection of the chipmaker's global reach. Plus, seeking common ground, President Joe Biden set to host his counterparts from South Korea and Japan today at Camp David, a three-way commitment spanning technology, diplomacy, and even security, all on the agenda. I'm Krita Gupta in New York. Danny Berger is off today. Let's dive right into the market action because you are seeing a sea of red around the world, specifically in the stock market. The Hang Seng Index over in China continue to see losses, a lot of an exodus in terms of fund flows, not just ent exiting that index specifically, but the entire region. And that's really resulting in the Hang Seng entering a bear market officially down about 20% from its peak, down 2% overnight specifically, not feeding well into sentiment both in the Europe 600 index, which you are now seeing extend their drop to session lows of about 1%. And again, bring that back down to the state side where you are seeing futures, again, worsen in line with what you're seeing in the European trading session. Remember, it is a summer Friday, so volume is going to be light. Nevertheless, a lot of the selling concentrated already 30 minutes into the show in the NASDAQ 100 futures, really where you're seeing a pullback of down four tenths. For our radio audience, S&P futures trading at 43.73. So that's your stock market picture. Not a ton of rosiness there. You might see a little bit of rosiness in the bond market where you are seeing a little bit of a bid. Call it a bid for safety if you must, but the German 10-year coming down, down at about nine basis points. You are seeing a 10-year yield in the UK, a similar story. So again, a global sentiment is very clearly flowing from Europe to the US this morning, as opposed to kind of two different fundamental stories. Remember, we did get that European inflation data earlier this morning that came kind of bang in line with estimates. Moving the euro, not necessarily moving the bond market off the data specifically that much. The 10-year yield, meanwhile, 423, we'll call it already down 
five basis points, but you look at the front end of the curve and you're not seeing the same read through, which brings us to the currency market, because again, overnight, China was really the story. And you're starting to see that with the offshore yuan crossing way past the fixing of about 7.2, 731 on that currency pair for dollar yuan. A quick check on the European currencies, though, because if you look at what's moving the Bloomberg dollar index as a whole, it's kind of a tug of war between the pound, which is weaker by about three tenths of one percent. A lot of that coming off the UK retail sales data that really wasn't in line with the rosiness you saw with other UK data sets this week. The other piece, the other part of the tug of war is the Mexican peso, which is actually significantly or was significantly stronger in the overnight session. The super peso uh, coming back and really weighing on the dollar. So that's going to be kind of, again, the tug of war that you really keep in mind. The EM story versus the developed market and specifically the European story. But if we're talking about what is driving today's trade, it is all about China. And you saw that in the currency market, the bond market, the stock market. So let's get a little bit more analysis there. Joining us now, Koku Agbo Blua, global head of economics, cross asset, and quant research over at SockGen. Basically, he's the guy at SockGen that does a little bit of everything. Koku, let's start with the China story. Overnight, we're starting to see state property developers now issue a little bit warnings of panic as well. What's the read through for the rest of the world? Well, I think this is clearly uh, there's clearly evidence that uh, China is entering all out uh, deflation uh, because you had uh, last month both PPI and CPI in negative territory. And I think it, what's happening there, it's a bit similar to in some cases uh, from in some aspects, similar to what happened in Japan in terms of balance sheet recession, uh, because post the COVID lockdowns, we didn't see the rebound that everyone was expecting. And I think it is really because of the negative wealth effect, whereby the marginal propensity to invest and take risk from a household in China has essentially collapsed. And they are more in a deleveraging mindset as opposed to a risk-taking mindset. Last but not least, I think the government is also engineering a massive deleveraging and restructuring of the property market and not, not bailing out all of the property developers and essentially trying to see through uh, this this deleveraging, which obviously is uh, having a negative impact on aggregate demand uh, and all the macro indicators. So, Koku, let's then talk about some of those macro indicators. When I want to kind of get a check on the health of the global economy, I immediately go to the commodity market. And my initial read through is simply that if you are seeing weakness in China, you are seeing weakness in that property development. The first commodities that are going to get hit are the likes of copper, iron ore, arguably even oil in sympathy. Koku, are we going to see that read through in the commodity sector, or is this something that's kind of priced in? Uh, that's a good point. I think we're seeing that in the copper market, which is obviously very exposed to uh, industrials and property in, uh, in particular. But what's interesting is that the oil market has rebounded and is, is now trading at the top of its its range, which you know presumably is, ought to be pretty surprising. But I think it's also a consequence of the significant OPEC cuts. Uh, that have led to a, a decrease in demand, but also you have a strong, uh, a resilient U.S. and European economy that is essentially offsetting the weakness uh, in China. Um, and last but not least, when it comes to metals, we should not uh, forget the energy transition that is obviously very metal intensive. It is not being reflected today because of the, the Chinese gravitational pull, uh, but to the medium longer term, we're still uh, pretty bullish on commodities, metals and, and energy. I love that you mentioned that the oil market is, at the end of the day, a function of the OPEC story, because one of the major themes we've been talking about, specifically stateside, is whether the green on the screen in the economic data, arguably the stock market, is a reflection of resiliency or recovery. And if you look at the oil market, it almost feels like a story of resiliency. Koku, what do you think? I think the resiliency argument is, is a good one, um, because it's ultimately a supply and demand uh, dynamic. Uh, and it's, I think we have sort of the great decoupling between a very resilient U.S. market, U.S. economy, uh, a bond market in the U.S. that is, you know, above the 4% and, and selling off. And, and on the other side, you have, you know, the second largest economy in the world that is in a deflationary uh, spiral and struggling to get its economy to, to recover. Um, so and as a, as a result, between these two forces, you have commodity market, currency market, et cetera, that are trying to find a, a new equilibrium. And I think we might be uh, potentially trading in a range uh, uh, until we sort of see whether the U.S. will uh, slow down in, the, in Q1 of next year, which is our, our sort of uh, base case scenario, even though uh, I see a lot of articles talking about a, a recession being canceled or 
or, or not showing up. But I think we'll uh, we'll have to figure this out over the next few months. Well, as a function of capitalism, we know that the recession will show up eventually. We just don't know whether it's going to be the next few months or the next few years. Koku, let's go back to the point you made about the deflationary spiral in China specifically. My immediate thought is you would see that kind of exported to Europe, to the U.S., through some of their kind of uh, production standpoints, through their exports, through uh, even their currency. But it doesn't feel like the U.S. or even Europe arguably is seeing that read through from the deflationary spiral. Have we... I don't want to say officially decoupled, but is this a sign that we're getting closer to that? Mm. Yes, it is an excellent point. I mean, China has exported deflation or disinflation over the years through low uh, cost of production in terms of unit labor costs, uh, et cetera, uh, over the past you know, 10, 20 years. But I think we need to be more precise when it comes to inflation, uh, because when you see commodity prices, we see uh, CPI headline inflation that has fallen, and, we, and, and that's sort of uh, very clear. The issue in the West is really uh, wage inflation, core inflation, and this is uh, something that's more uh, specific to the labor market tightness of the U.S. and the European economy. And, and the U.K., uh, for example, saw uh, you know one of the highest wage inflation uh, on uh, over the past sort of uh, few decades. Um, so therefore, China is is exporting deflation when it comes to headline, but it is not yet when it comes to core. And I think this is where both are unlikely to 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 recouple uh, because you need ultimately a, a recession for uh, wage inflation and core inflation to to really uh, stabilize. So I think this is where the limit of the argument um, goes. Well, speaking of, of limits, Koku, a final question on the stock market here, because if we are seeing a, a little bit of red on the screen, I think the S&P 500 specifically already seeing that 5% retracement, which to be fair is completely normal on a technical basis. The bullish argument for the stock market is simply that you are seeing this resilience. You are seeing these corporate profit margins increase in a way that the consumer is still able to digest. In the context of the carnage we saw in 2022 and this 5% retracement, what is the bearish argument for the S&P 500? Well, yes, I think the bearish argument is to see a, a continued sell-off in, in the bond market and, have a, and see a breakdown in the equity bond correlation. Uh, and we're starting to see that for multi-asset portfolios struggling again because bonds and equities are falling at the same time. Um, and this is, I think, at the core of the argument. And the second key point is that the driver behind equities have been greedflation. So this ability, this incredible ability of companies to have passed, to, have to, to pass on higher input prices uh, and consumer being able to uh, stomach some of that because of excess savings. But today, the savings, the excess savings of the COVID period has uh, has fallen significantly. So we are likely to see uh, demand offsetting the benefit of these, these price increases that have driven a uh, very high profit margin. So yeah. this will lead to slowdown in, in profit margin and eventually positioning will sort of you know, take care of the rest in, in terms of unwinding uh, and taking risk off. Last but not least, cash gets you 4 or 5% today. So, yeah. you know, there's a, an alternative. Uh, a, a lot to digest. Koku, I wish we had more time, uh, maybe a couple of hours if possible. Koku Blua over at SockGen, we thank you as always for joining us this morning. Coming up on the program, President Biden will host the leaders of South Korea and Japan in a historic summit as concerns about China and North Korea grow in the region. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an interview with Bain Capital Senior Advisor Steve Pagliuca. That interview coming up at 6.30 a.m. New York, 11.30 a.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York. Danny Berger is off today. President Biden will host the leaders of South Korea and Japan at Camp David today. The historic gathering reflects how concerns about China and North Korea are forging a closer relationship between the U.S. and its two chief allies in the region. China likely to be high on the agenda amid deepening economic pressure there 
For more, we're joined by John Herskovitz, Bloomberg East Asia government editor and Bloomberg Opinion columnist Garode Reedy joining us from Tokyo. Pleasure to have you both on the ground and on the show. We thank you as always. Jan, let me start with you here. I'm fascinated by this idea of kind of this American alliance, this trilateral alliance to deal with some of the pressure specifically in the South China Sea. But this has been a narrative going on for a while. How successful might these talks be? What could actually yield from it? Well, we've gotten some idea of what's going to come out of this. We're going, some of the things that have been floated already include um, real-time data sharing on North Korean missile launches. They're also looking to step up uh, three-way military exercises among the U.S., Japan, and South Korea, doing things like uh, missile interception, submarine detection. And we'll probably get some statements about um, yeah, being working in times of crises. What we're going to get is a much closer communication, strategic network, and uh, military uh, infrastructure among these three players. So in that sense, this is going to be a pretty significant uh, summit in terms of security. And it was something like this was almost unthinkable a few years ago when tensions between South Korea and Japan related to issues of history were so overwhelming that the U.S. alliance or its alliance with Japan and South Korea was coming into question. Intelligence sharing was difficult. So this is this marks quite a turnaround from where things were a few years ago. Garode, weigh in on the military alliance that John just talked about here, because if you actually look at the funding going towards, say, uh, the U.S. naval presence in the Pacific, it's actually been declining over the next few years. How can the U.S. actually have these conversations if the funding isn't there? Well, I think what the U.S. needs is obviously they need their allies to step up, and I think that comes to the core of, of why this uh, summit is happening at this time, precisely because the U.S. needs Japan and South Korea to, you know, to 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 get along, basically, in a way that they haven't been uh, able to do so over the past few years. You know, it's becoming increasingly clear, and and both, you know, I would say all three parties in this uh, in these talks have adopted quite similar language and quite similar strategies strategy that was initially laid out uh, by Japan as it happens in terms of talking about the Indo-Pacific region and forging alliances across the region and the sometimes unspoken although sort of increasingly now spoken um you know message behind that is to forge this alliance of like-minded countries in order to contain China and prevent conflict from from spilling out. In the past, I think we've seen Japan and South Korea have not been able to get along to the extent that Washington would like them to. But now we're starting to see that change. Well, let's talk then about the sticking points here when it comes to this potential alliance. Uh, Garod, weigh in on this for me, if you will. I'm a markets gal. I love to look at the currencies. We've seen a record fixing here in uh, for the offshore yuan just this morning. One of the currency conversations is simply trading the export story through the yen, through the Korean yuan, and then, of course, through the yuan as well. Could we see that economic competition become a sticking point in this conversation? I think we'll see. Um, I don't think the economic side of things are going to be at the forefront this time. Obviously, there will be conversation about that. I, I think we'll see more, certainly more uh, results or more kind of language come out of this that has to do more um, with defense. But there is obviously a lot of work that needs to be done, particularly, I would say, on the Korean side, Japan. Uh, or sorry, the, the U.S. has done quite a good job of convincing uh, Japan to buy into its, particularly its its export controls around um, semiconductors. Uh, South Korea is not quite at that level just yet, so I think there's going to be a couple of um, sticky uh, talking points to be had around that. That could become um, a little bit a little bit of an issue. Obviously, there are other kind of trade talks that are going on uh, as well separately to this, but um, you know certainly. We will see, I think, in particular when it comes to semiconductors, when it comes to supply chains, those are going to be on the agenda uh, this weekend. But I don't think we're going to see um, such a huge um, notable outcome along the lines of the sort of more yeah. uh, defense minded that, things that John mentioned. 
Yeah, Samsung, SK Hilux, I mean, two of the largest companies coming out of South Korea. I think Samsung makes like a third of the South Korean stock index. There's no way this is not going to be a sticking point. But John, weigh in here on that chip story, because of course we know a part of the Biden administration's uh, kind of MO has been to move a lot of that chip production back to the states, something that I believe Rahm Emanuel, one of the ambassadors to uh, Japan, has actively been working to kind of broker Talk to us a little bit about how successful that transition might actually be. Well, from the South Korean side, there's a little bit more exposure to China with um, SK Hynix and Samsung having fabrication plants there. So South Korea is a little bit more um, apprehensive, timid than Japan is in going on these uh, chip alliances. But one of the selling points for South Korea has been that it's in its best interest to get along with Japan for its own economic uh, future. I and mean, South Korea and Japan have been natural competitors for years and years, but the uh, friction between them caused some difficulties and caused some worries. So I think that the security and the economic part of this are going to be somewhat interlinked. Um, and while the summit is going to focus on security, uh, the idea of the uh, Biden chip curbs, getting South Korea more on board, is going to be a part of this. And South Korea is also trying to get something from the Biden administration, uh, mostly with um, electric vehicles. It has uh, a major plant in Georgia, the uh, Kia Hyundai Group, and they're trying to get uh, into some of the U.S. subsidies for purchases of electric vehicles, which go for domestic production. South Korea's cars are excluded at this time. So there's going to be a little bit of maneuvering on that front as well. A, a lot to digest and three crucial companies, uh, not just, or countries, excuse me, you can tell I'm a markets reporter, three crucial countries, not just in uh, the Asia Pacific region, but truly for the export story around the world. John Herskovitz and Garod Reedy. And joining us from Tokyo, we thank you as always. Coming up on the program, let's get to some fun news. It's been a, it's been a little bit of a Debbie Downer of a day. It's England versus Spain in the World Cup final this weekend. Up next, we're going to focus on why it's a big gamble for the sports giants like Nike and Adidas. Story you don't want to miss. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York. Danny Berger is off today. The sporting world's attention will be on Sydney this weekend when Spain meets England in the Women's World Cup final. The tournament has been played out in front of packed arenas in Australia and New Zealand in the most attended Women's World Cup ever. But the surge in interest is translated to merchandise challenges for the likes of Adidas and Nike. Bloomberg's Oliver Crick joins us now. Oliver, what's the dilemma here for some of those brands? Right, so you have England versus Spain. You also have Nike versus Adidas. And what you have that they have in common is obviously you don't know who's going to win, so you don't know where the demand is going to be for these jerseys, and they take months to produce. So they are basically in this position of overproducing, in which case you're sitting on a ton of inventory, which has been a huge problem for Adidas, or even worse, underproducing, which you know, investors won't be happy, and neither will fans. So it's also unforgiving because whenever something big happens, the fans really want these jerseys. You have about a 72-hour window. If you don't have them, then you're in trouble. And when England beat Australia earlier this this week, we saw demand surge 340% for England jerseys. So how do you figure this out? They look at historical data. The problem is with women's soccer, the interest, the large interest is rather new, so you don't have that much to go off of. The Adidas CEO saying that we basically do not know how to figure this out entirely. If someone does, we'll hire you on the spot. So how do you even deal with that? How do you mitigate that kind of risk? So there's two interesting kind of examples for the two kinds of football. We'll go American and uh, European since we're such a transatlantic show. So you have Aaron Rodgers, speculation about him joining the Jets. And as that sort of built, what they did is they built a ton of inventory for just blank Jets uh, uh, jerseys and that they later, when he when it was confirmed, they managed to just put his name on and they managed to get out. And those sold as more than the nine other players after him in terms of volume. And then you have the other exception, Lionel Messi there, uh, going to Inter Miami. And that was very down to the wire in terms of which team he was going to join. And they have a very loud pink jersey, so you couldn't do that same sort of thing. And so that news broke, I think, back in June. And you're still on back order now in the middle of August for Adidas. I mean, have you tried to book a flight to Miami lately? Because they're so expensive because of him. A final question to you, Ali. Interest obviously rising in women's soccer. Uh, we'll call it football for a European audience, if you will. Where's the money? Is it there? 
Well, so this is sort of interesting. We'll go through some of the numbers. So the sponsorship numbers have gone way up. You've got 20 sponsors. The team numbers have gone way up. You have 32 teams, 1.5 million tickets sold, 500 million people watching. Um, but really, when it comes down to the sponsorship in terms of cash, that's where you see the huge divide. We're talking about 300 million for the Women's World Cup and 1.7 billion for the men's. And what's interesting from an advertising standpoint is you have a different makeup in terms of who's watching. There's a much closer gender parity in terms of who's watching uh, women's soccer. And also, it's down to the individual players on social media. The yeah. women players tend to engage more, even if they have fewer followers, which is good for uh, revenue. A, a highly watched game. Ollie, I'm sure you're going to be t tuning in as well. Thank you, as always, for joining the program. That does it for early edition. Surveillance is ahead. This is Bloomberg.